Thanks, Tim, and thanks for having me here. Um, since I've only got 10 minutes, I'll jump straight in. Um, this slide basically outlines what we do here at Benchmark from mine to EV throughout the supply chain. Just keeping in mind that the materials we cover are not just primary processed commoditized uh, minerals. These are specialized materials which feed into other specialized end uses. The key part for us is collecting firsthand data from market participants on weekly, monthly, quarterly basis. Uh, this could be uh, pricing, volumes, uh, numerous other things, allowing us to do our robust analysis that we do on repeat. Uh, but the best way to find out more is to contact me or reach out via the website. Uh, next slide, please. What are we all here for? Uh, what are the driving forces behind the lithium ion economy? We're calling it a lithium ion economy to describe what is happening and to describe what leading economies need to do, not just build massive lithium ion capacity to fuel EV and storage, but also the upstream, which starts with raw materials and the downstream, of course, building the EVs themselves, the platforms, recycling, closing the loop. That's what we mean by that. We don't just see China doing it now, uh, not just Europe replicating that, it's also North America, especially the US, building a complete economy, which includes massive battery capacity. Let's take a step back. Um, what are we building with? What, well, what are we building a lithium ion economy for? First, the concerns around the environment, sustainability, circular economy, driven by scientific data. These concerns are increasingly influenced. Um, they're, they're influencing investment sentiment as well as government decisions. Supply chain security concerns, as well as demographic changes are reinforcing these concepts, uh, these concerns and speeding up a change in government policy and investment decisions. These government policies are arriving in the form of criticality analyses, foreign investment laws, and most importantly, emissions laws. And while ESG and demographic changes are influencing money directly, investment decisions are also being largely affected by government measures because one of the largest emitters and uh, one at the forefront of all of our minds is the auto industry. It's been the target of investment, regulation, demographic, demand. Uh, it's a big industry and the need for them to be carbon neutral means that we need a lot of batteries, resulting in the figures on the right. And that was that's just being pulled from the latest monthly mega factory assessment that we do, where we're tracking over 200 sites. But just five years ago, this was something like 10. So things have really blown up. And uh, uh, next slide, please. Now, this is best exemplified by lithium. As you can see, lithium demand did a 180 degree change in just five years. We expect demand from lithium ion batteries to continue growing to 2030 and beyond. Next slide, please. From 2020 to 30, we're expecting an increase of 22% CAGR in demand, and it's going to be hard for lithium to keep up. This has been due to multiple factors, but we are calling this gap the great raw material disconnect. Operating mines will make up less than a quarter of the output expected by 2030. And if you account for all the projects, finance and unfinanced, you still won't hit that demand growth in 2030. This year, lithium is just about balanced, but we are seeing the beginning of the deficit. And we think for multiple reasons, this will be sustained going forward. <clears throat> now that's important. Um, I wanna pause there because you won't either, you won't have your electric vehicles, if that's the case. That's most important. If we go back to tackle the fundamental drivers behind this movement, which is emissions, but also to stave off competing technologies like sodium ion. So it's really in the best interest of the industry in every way to close the gap in the great raw material disconnect. Next slide, please. Flake graphite, uh, it takes 2.2 tonnes of flake graphite to make one tonne of anode. I've put the flake numbers here, a gap increasing and requiring new projects to come online. Uh, next slide. The other key thing for the 2030 raw material disconnect is that the proportion of flake graphite going into make batteries will grow significantly. The influence of lithium ion and flake graphite will significantly increase in the coming years. Next slide. Cobalt, an important one. It's going nowhere and the gap is increasing. The gap between operational supply and demand will be larger than the entire market is today. Next slide, please. And already an important part of lithium ion batteries, the proportion of cobalt is decreasing, yes, but it continues to play an important role in the safety of those batteries. 
There are LFP battery plants being built, of course, and they are good for lower range costs, but NCM will be the dominant chemistry for the foreseeable future, particularly in Europe and North America. Next, please. Now, nickel, this is how we view nickel sulfate. Um, that's what's going into batteries. The gap is increasing there. Um, and importantly, uh, next slide, please. One which you may not know is that battery demand will be the fastest growing sector in the nickel industry out to 2030 and beyond. Next slide, please. Where's it going to come from? It's going to come from everywhere across the world. Disruptors are essential. New companies are essential. Otherwise, we aren't going to be able to do what we need to do. It's also important to note that costs are essential. Uh, of course, raw materials are actually becoming a larger percentage of the overall costs of the batteries as they get cheaper themselves. On the other hand, we are going to have to balance lower costs. Uh, a drive to reach demand to fill the gap in the great raw material disconnect with supply chain security and localization of supply, those considerations, as well as ESG and sustainability considerations. Next slide. Uh, ESG considerations are important, even if you, and there aren't many anymore, even if you don't believe in climate change, ESG encompasses social and governance factors. ESG awareness really just highlights good risk management practices. In fact, there was a study done recently that showed that companies who were improving their ESG reporting were also more likely to be improving on their value of the company at the same time. So it probably shows something about improving practices and risk awareness throughout that company. And uh, next slide, please. In summary, there are a few raw material realities I wanted to highlight. Scaling supply chain quality and quantity is the challenge. Quality in terms of impurities and so on, but also ESG considerations and the quality of the company. Next, the, the, the slowest link in the chain, uh, which is the mining and extraction side of things, is starved of investment. Take a look at this graph on the right and you will see that there is a huge amount of time needed to bring product to market overall. But one of the most longest, most time consuming and underappreciated parts of this is the mine. And I think particularly the approvals process, the mine and chemical processing of lithium particularly is underfunded. The EV revolution is underway. Tesla's CEO, uh, Elon Musk declared this week that the electric car market is at a global inflection point. The company just delivered its first billion dollar quarterly profit. Uh, the next point is that there is no geological shortage of any of the minerals I've listed in this presentation, but there is often a shortage of investment and good technical knowledge. It's, uh, it's also a young industry growing fast. The next point would be that the future tech will likely be lithium based. That demand, the investment sunk into this technology is so far ahead of anything else. The next point is the lithium ion battery is now geopolitical. China has shored up a lot of the supply chain and countries are responding. And lastly, supply will need to consider ESG factors, not just emissions, but water and social impacts too, as we are already seeing demand from the EV manufacturers who are increasingly entering into contracts upstream. We have good visibility there at Benchmark. And uh, next slide, please, just to finish off. And if anybody has any more detailed questions, please forward them to, to the email there. Thank you. Thanks, Cameron. Short and sweet. Um, just some questions here. Um, charging at home, um, can you speak to, is there a bigger opportunity outside EV and can you speak to the kind of the demand coming from the home and from the grid? I'd, I'd direct a more detailed um, answer towards my colleague Andy, who, who, who's actually working currently on a battery recycling report, and that will encompass things like second lifing those um, end uses. It's definitely something we've already put into our supply and demand projections, which is what we think is going to come from second life, um, secondary supply. Um, we've seen in our conversations with OEMs and suppliers and battery manufacturers that they're all interested in how can we reuse EV batteries in um, home storage, for example, as another life for those batteries. And that potentially has negative supply implications and potentially extending the amount of time before it comes back into um, the supply chain in a circular economy. And, and do you have any more colour? Do you have any colour at all on the, the magnes market as, as a component of, of the battery? 
Oh, you know, I, did, I did actually think that um, as I was presenting, but I, I hope Marco will, will be able to fill in all those gaps there. And to be honest, I wouldn't have the the confidence to to present on on manganese. Um, my role is mostly focused on lithium, and sure. I, I, yeah. So, uh, but we've got the we got the guys internally who can answer any questions if someone would like them. background. Yeah. And and did you say you're putting out a report on on recycling and, and what play? what role that will play also. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we, we, of course we have our own internal demand projections and supply for recycling, but we, we want to get a bit more granular on that as it becomes more important. All right now it's not obviously too important and not making up a huge chunk of supply, if any, really outside of China. Um, but we, of course it's going to become, and if you have a look at our projections, is an important, very important part of, of supply um, in the next decade, 10 or 20 years from now. Yeah. And, and finally, there's a question here. Um, Lithium-ion batteries with their nickel and manganese-rich cathodes will be the dominant cell format for some time to come. Can the upstream actually develop in time to meet your lofty demand profile? And what are the kind of key risks to an effective rollout that you could see? Yeah, yeah, and as I think so. It's just going to take a bit longer than the current the EV manufacturers think it will. And the, um, the, the amount of time that they think it will take to um, uh, develop some of the upstream supply that will feed into these batteries that um, there's some really lofty ambitions out there, uh, carbon neutral by 2030 and, or some other nice round number. Um, we're only just starting to see the downstream investment come in sort of uh, from the EV manufacturers down into the mine sites, you see it. Um, BMW and, and so on entering into supply chain contracts. So that will help um, definitely. And uh, hopefully that answers the question, Tim. <laughs> and, and what about um, the, the five metals you mentioned? What is the one with the highest deficit demand over the next five years? It's always been spoke or spoken yeah. about. Nickel, what's your thoughts there? Yeah, and personally, because I'm um, the lithium analyst, I think I like to think that it's lithium um, in a sense because uh, potentially there's a lot of supply hiding behind the nickel numbers in terms of the larger nickel market. But in terms of nickel, you've also got a lot of supply coming in, and I'm sure Stephen will talk about it. Um, nickel coming in from Indonesia and various places with dubious ESG credentials. And I think that's really important thing to note that it's not just also supply and demand and the gap, it's where OEMs and EV manufacturers are demanding that their lithium and nickel come from and what's the actual uh, CO2 emission, water and social um, uh, impacts cut off on some of those and will the, the suppliers be able to meet that? Of course, you need everything you can get your hands on at this point in time and for the next 10 years, um, beggars can't be choosers. But you do see, and there's no preference in terms of pricing right now, but there might be a preference in terms of... Uh, companies that will be able to attract the best investment and the best partners.